Hey everybody, today we're going to be looking at the Gaussian integral and how to do polar substitution. So the Gaussian integral is the following integral is the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of e to the negative x squared dx. So just looking at, if you were to look at the indefinite integral, so just the integral of e to the negative x squared dx, this has no um, clo like no closed form. Um, no effort, the term's blanking, but I know there's like a specific term for this. Uh, basically, it's not no elementary. Yeah, there's no elementary function that represents the indefinite integral of e to the negative x squared. Um, so we but we can use um, actually polar integration to evaluate this. So I'm, what I'm going to do is uh, rewrite this integral but everywhere that there's an x instead of an x I'm going to write a y. So e to the negative y squared dy. And so what we can do is multiply these integrals together and so we'll get i squared. And when we multiply these two integrals together we actually um, can write it as a double integral and so um, it's going to look a little cramped here. I'm really bad at drawing infinities. Um, <laughs> anyway, so for both these integrals are from negative infinity to positive infinity. And in the inside, we have e to the negative x squared times e to the negative y squared dx dy. Um, but instead of writing all that out, since these are both exponentials, we can just um, add the exponents. And so we end up getting e to the negative x squared plus y squared dx dy. So now we have the following double integral that we wish to evaluate. Now here I'm going to explain how polar integration works. Now polar coordinates are a substitute to Cartesian coordinates. Cartesian coordinates are where you have an x and a y with respect to some origin point. Let's say like this is our origin. And so uh, the coordinates x comma y correspond to x going x in the right direction and y in the up direction. Instead, um, in polar you have, um, you represent the coordinates by the length or the distance from the origin to the point. We call that R. And the angle that the, that that line makes with the positive x-axis. And we call that theta. So instead of x comma y, we have r comma theta. Now, that's all fine and dandy. Now we see that we have here basically a right triangle um, with one angle of theta, a hypotenuse of r. Um, adjacent to the theta angle is x, and opposite the theta angle is y. Um, so from here, we immediately see that um, x squared plus y squared equals r squared, just by the Pythagorean theorem. And now we see that if we have some small change, or basically what dx dy refers to, this is some small area. It's basically a, a rectangle corresponding to a tiny, I, I should really write bigger here, 
um, a tiny dx and a tiny uh, dy and so dx dy is just this area and instead we want to write this in terms of r r dr and d theta and so um, Unfortunately, there isn't a nice way to sort of represent this area in terms of dr and d theta. The way that we get dx times dy is by using something called the Jacobian. The Jacobian is the determinant of a matrix that will give, give us a ratio between dx dy and dr and d theta. So it is defined as um, the partial of x with respect to r. Uh, that's the first entry. And then the partial of x with respect to theta. And then the second row is the partial. I'm sorry, these don't really look like partials, but that's very hard for me to write. Um, and that should be a y. My bad. That was much better. Y, D, R. And then lastly, the partial of y with respect to theta. Now, what will all these entries actually be? You can notice that from this right triangle definition that the cosine of theta is equal to x over r. And so we can just multiply both sides by r and get x is equal to r times cosine of theta. Similarly, y is equal to r times the sine of theta. Therefore, this matrix will become uh, the partial of r cosine theta with respect to r is just cosine theta. And similarly, for y, we will get sine theta. And then the partial of x with respect to theta, that will be negative r sine theta. And the partial of y with, res with respect to theta is r cosine theta. Then this comes out to be r cosine squared of theta, which is the product of these two entries, minus negative r sine squared of theta, because the determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix is the product of these entries minus the product of these entries. And we notice that this negative and this negative cancel out, and we can factor out an r. And we get r times, and then we get cosine squared plus sine squared, which is just 1. So in all, the Jacobian is r. Oops. And so like I said, this r is the factor, is the ratio between dx dy and dr d theta. So dx dy equals r dr d theta. Now 
we can rewrite this integral into polar coordinates. First we should think about our boundaries. If, if x and y both go from negative infinity to positive infinity, then that means that we're covering the entire plane. So we need to think about what bounds for r and theta will cover the entire plane. Well, if theta sweeps all the way from 0 to 2 pi, a full revolution, and r is some positive radius, then you know, for some given theta, we will reach all points along this line as r goes from 0 to theta. And so we can sweep that line across, or really this is not even a line, this is a ray, technically. Um, so we have a ray shooting for each angle theta, which means that we will cover every single point. So r will go from 0 to, th uh, zero to infinity, and theta will go from 0 to 2 pi. then we can rewrite this. We get 0 to 2 pi. Up, I'm just putting the theta bound second. So this is for theta. And then r goes from 0 to infinity. And then here, like I said here, x squared plus y squared equals r squared. That is what motivates us to do the substitution in the first place, because we get a nice expression here. We get e to the negative r squared. Now here we get dr d theta times r. So r dr d theta. Now a double integral, we can just look at this inside. And this is all in terms of r. And What's more is that we can use a nice substitution here because we have e to the something and then something that resembles that something's derivative. In other words, if we use the u substitution, u equals negative r squared, then that means that du is equal to negative 2r dr, meaning that this r dr is just negative du over 2, and that this negative r squared is just u. So, uh, and then we can factor out a negative 1 half from both, or just through the entire integral. So we still have our 0 to 2 pi on theta. Oh man. And then if r is 0, then u is 0. And if r is theta, then u is negative infinity. I mean, I, I'm sorry. I meant if r is, if r goes to infinity, then u, which is negative r squared, goes to negative infinity. So then we have the integral from 0 to negative infinity of e to the positive u du and then d theta. So again, we can just focus on this inside integral. Now this will be e to the negative infinity minus e to the 0 e to the negative infinity is the same as re raising 1 over e to the infinity power, which obviously just goes to 0. e to the 0 is just 1. So this whole inside integral is just negative 1, which is just a constant. So we can factor that as, out as well. So we have a negative 1 half and a negative 1. So then we just have 1 half times the integral from 0 to 2 pi of d theta, 
which is, well, this integral will evaluate to 2 pi minus 0, so just 2 pi, and then times 1 half, we get pi. Then our original integral, i, we solve for i squared because we multiplied these two integrals together. We c combine them to get a double integral. So i squared is equal to pi, so our original integral is equal to the square root of pi. I hope I made everything about the Jacobian and polar integration clear. Uh, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.